everybody. This is Terry Nance. I am the author of God's Armor Bearer. I know many of you are familiar with the Armor Bearer. The revelation the Lord gave me years ago when I was serving my pastor as an associate pastor in the local church, the Lord just said very clearly to my heart to be an armor bearer to my pastor, to lift up the arms of my leader, run with the vision of the house, run with what I put in the heart of your leader, and then I will fulfill your vision. And you know, we are here as in the body of Christ, we're here to complete, we're not here to compete. And in that, God used me to go all over the world teaching this message. This season in my life right now, while I was in prayer recently, I felt the Holy Spirit just releasing me to begin to take this message again around the world. And so we've done these uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos, which we call it eight, eight Minutes Strong with the Armor Bearer. But I want to do the actual teaching. It's a conference. It's four hours long. The first lesson is uh, on what an armor bearer is. Number two is spiritual authority. Number three is the function of an armor bearer. And number four, number four is really what a pastor looks for when he's looking for armor bearers. You know, the church right now is in a critical state. Uh, COVID just caused the, the people just to leave and many people have not come back. And the Spirit of the Lord, there's an awakening that's taking place, and it is an armor bearer awakening that people are beginning to see, hey, I've got to get reconnected. I've got to get my life back into the local church and to support my leaders. And so if you might be interested as a pastor, if you're interested in having me in, you can contact my ministry. You can go to my website, godsarmorbearer.com, and you can get all the information. You can call me at 501 75 530033 and would love to come into your area and do an armor bearer conference. Also, something else that I have been doing, I am a life coach and a mentor, and we've been taking people in the local church, several people, and what the uh, the churches are doing, they're sponsoring several several people, and I've been coaching them and mentor, mentoring them on how to start an armor bearer class. Because if you can have an armor bearer class in your church, that which is a continual class, it may be a new members class or however you want to call it. It could be an armor bearer class. Everyone who comes in your church has the spirit and the heart of an armor bearer to run with your vision. And I mean, you're going to, you're going to see an incredible impact and you're going to see an incredible unity in your local church. So that's my heart. And so I just pray, uh, that uh, the material you're going to watch here on the YouTube channel will be a blessing to you. But again, if you want to talk to me, contact me, you can go to my website, godsarmorbearer.com and get the information. We're going to be doing the four lessons on the YouTube channel. So I wanted to send you the first lesson. I want to send you as a pastor and I want you to hear my heart and I pray this ministers to you in a very powerful way. Thank you. Here's where I, I want to start with. Acts chapter four, verse 29 through 32. Now, Lord, Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of the holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, when I was reading that one day, I thought, man, that's revival. I mean, the house literally shook. Now, I've been in some services where we said, man, God just shook this place and people got delivered, saved, born again, healed, incredible things. But I've never been in a place where the literal house began to shake or the foundation of the church began to shake. But it happened. And this is 
very promising for us because this is New Testament. It's not Old Testament. Sometimes we want to look at all the miracles being in the Old Testament, but we see it here. This is New Testament. So God wants to demonstrate this type of power in our day. And I believe we're coming in to this hour. And I believe there is an armor bearer awakening. The church has been through an incredible assault since COVID and, and pastors dying and churches closing and there's 16 to 1600 2000 pastors leaving the ministry today i mean the church is in a very critical state but we know that there's coming an awakening and a revival and along with that though it's going to come through i believe the grassroots which is the spirit and heart of the armor bearer the church rising up connecting with their leaders and running with them but i i read that and i and i and i said to the lord one day i said well how do we see that how how does this come to pass and he just said to me read verse 32 and it says in the multitude of those that believe were of one heart and one soul now there is a difference between being of one heart and one soul one heart means you are you're a part of the body of christ you're connected to the body of christ and so we're the family of God. Many of you don't know me personally, but we're family. It makes no difference what race we are. We are the family of God. But, but one heart and one soul in the local church is different. And if you can just imagine, if I had your pastor in front of me and I stood behind your pastor, and I put my hands on his back and I said, pastor, I'm behind you. Uh, and then I got that, that this is one heart. Uh, Pastor, I'm behind you. Then I get a little further away. Pastor, I'm behind you. Then I get way back here and I go, Pastor, I'm way behind you. And you know something? There are some people so far behind their pastor, they don't even know who their pastor is. Now, you you can say this. I know he's not talking about me, so nobody gets any, any condemnation or guilt. But here's the truth. That's where so many people in the local church are. They're behind their pastor, but here's one heart and one soul. That's one heart. When you get up and you got your hands on your pastor and then all of a sudden you move beside your pastor, now that's one heart and one soul. You're no longer behind them. You are with them. See, you have a calling. You have a gift on the inside of you, but the key to being heart and soul is that you come alongside your leader and you bring your vision under what I call the vision of the house. Every pastor, every church uh, has what is called the visionary. The visionary is that man or woman of God, which is serving in a uh, a governmental office of the kingdom, a, a apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. And they're serving in that office and that is, they're the visionary and they communicate the vision to the local church. They communicate the vision to you. Then you come alongside with your vision, whatever God has put in you, the giftings that he has, and you have gifts and callings in you and you connect alongside them and you join and you become a part of the vision of the house. You are connected. Now I want to say something to you. And if you don't get anything out of this, I want you to get this. You are not here to compete. You are here to complete. When you are here to compete, uh, complete, you are running with the vision. When you're here to compete, you are running with division. There's a difference between vision and division. And God wants you to run with the vision of the house. So number one in our notes, the church must become one heart and one soul. One heart means we're connected because we're members of the body of Christ. One soul uh, means we are connected with the vision of the house. So I want you to say it, one heart and one soul. That's what God wants for us. Every church has its own vision, and you have to ask yourself where you fit in the vision of the house. Now, the revelation of the armor bearer. Let me just share with you how uh, this came about. I was, I was, uh, I started serving in ministry when I was 18 years old. I was an associate pastor, uh, or, or actually a youth director. And then in 1979, my wife and I, we came to Little Rock and we started in a local church here in Little Rock. And then I served there for like 
two or three years before the revelation came, but I had a real call on my life for world missions. And we had started a mission school and we had seven families that were put on the mission field. And at the time I'm in my mid twenties, 25, 26 years old. And I started traveling around the world Man, I was so excited. We, we had families on the field and I was traveling and we were connecting all kinds of good things were happening. And I had come back from the Philippines and my wife and I were sitting, him one one night and we just got to talking about the blessings of the Lord and I just began to share with her man look what God's done in our lives at such a young age and the more I talk the more I sense the presence of the Lord and I felt like I said Kim I gotta go pray so I went and I sat down in my living room chair and I just said Lord what are you saying and then I heard in my heart go read the story of David and Saul. So I had my Bible. I turned it over and I started in First Samuel 17, reading, uh, uh, you know, uh, about David and about Saul. And I started reading. And then I come down to this scripture, First Samuel 16, 21. So David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. And when I read that, that word literally lifted off the pages to me. And my heart, man, I just began to burn. And God said to me, I am calling you to be your pastor's armor bearer. And then he began to say to me, Terry, I want you to lay down your vision. Take up the vision of the house. That was the first time I heard that term. Run with what I put in the heart of your pastor. Now, you may think, I bet you were just jumping and shouting, oh, glory to God. God's giving me a a wonderful revelation, but that, that I, I didn't. I, matter of fact, I fell in the floor. I had my my face in the floor, and I, I began to just say, "Lord, you know, what about my vision? What about this vision you put in my heart for the world before I've ever met my pastor?" And the Spirit of God said to me, "Terry, I want you to lay down your vision. And if you'll do that, I'll prove to you and show you every dream and vision that you have will come to pass." And then he said this principle, what you make happen for someone else, I will make happen for you. That is the principle of the kingdom. And then God said, Jesus really spoke to me at that time. Man, I tell you, I was shaking. I really was. And it it was sinking deep in me. And I heard him say to me, and besides that, Terry, I'm not asking you to do anything I didn't do myself. I came from my father, laid down my will and desire. And didn't God highly exalt Jesus Christ? So that is what the revelation of the armor bearer is all about. Now, I want to say this. I want to make this very clear at the very beginning, because I know some people, they have that, they have this saying, and I had someone call me one day. They'd read the armor bearer book and they were just like, you're just trying to take an Old Testament office and make it New Testament. And I just said to them, you're missing the whole point. The armor bearer is not an office. It's an attitude. It is through the New Testament. It's the heart of a servant. It is giving yourself to one another and giving yourself to the leadership that God's placed in your life in the local church. And so now I will say, now I know there are inner circle armor bearers and I teach that in my latest book, God's armor bearer for the next generation. Uh, but in that, I know there are inner circle like Jesus had a Peter, James and John. And honestly, if you look at the, the apostles, the 12 apostles, you know what they started at? They were armor bearers. They served Jesus. They prepared, uh, they did whatever he asked. He asked them to feed the people. They got them set down. They fed the people. They prepared his way wherever he went into cities. They were armor bearers. That's what they were armor bearers before they became apostles. And if you want to be an apostle, you're going to start as an armor bearer. Any office that you want in ministry, that's where you start. It comes through the heart of serving. Now, the word armor bearer it comes from two, two Hebrew words. It comes from nasa, which it means to lift. Now, listen to this. These are the, the words that describe what an armor bearer really is. It is to accept your leader, to advance your leader, to hold them up, to bear them up, to carry them, to pardon them, to furnish, to feather, to give, help, regard, and respect. Then the word kali, which means to complete, to consume, to be done, to finish, to destroy utterly, to fulfill, to bring to pass, or to make clean, 
riddance. Now, from these two Hebrew words, we can clearly see the duty of an armor bearer. Number one, it is to accept your leave. So we're going to see really the attitude, and it is the function. There's two different functions, and I'll show you this. So first of all, you're accepting your leader. You're advancing them. You're showing respect to them. You're going to regard them. You're going to help them, and you're going to give, and you're going to bear them up. So it's really an attitude uh, and it's also an action, but it, here, it's really an attitude. But then we get into spiritual warfare. Here's the warfare of an armor bearer is the word Kali. It means to complete, to consume, to be done, to finish, destroy utterly, to fulfill, to bring to pass, and to make clean riddance. So we can see that an armor bearer, you know, you may ask, you know, when you look at David, David never criticized and never came against Saul. Uh, and, and he had opportunity. He could have killed him in the cave, if you know the story. And his heart smote him because he just cut off a piece of his garment. And he refused to touch God's anointed, even though Saul was out to kill him. And so you say, how could he, how could he have that kind of attitude? Well, when you understand he was Saul's armor bearer, David was used to laying his life down for uh, Saul, he literally carried the shield into battle to protect him. So, uh, the, the, the function here out of these words, you can see number one, he was there to assist and encourage. That's number one. He was to assist. Uh, uh that's what an armor bearer, you're to assist your pastor, assist your leader and encourage it. And then number two, you are to stand strong with them. And that is whatever season they're going through. Because here's the thing about ministry. It is seasonal. Uh, you know, the kingdom operates not in dates and not in times. And you may think, well, I know we always have a theme for the new year. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God doesn't work according to a calendar. God works in season. The kingdom runs in seasons. And you may say, well, Pastor Terry, how long is the season? Well, I'll tell you, it's from the beginning to the end. That's how long a season is. From the beginning to the end. Now, so you're there to stand strong through the seasons. Then you're there to protect them, but you're also there to love and forgive. So you can see those functions of an armor bearer. Now, let me talk about the anointing of an armor bearer. He is anointed to carry his leader's shield. He was to be committed and faithful to his leader. Second Kings chapter three, verse 10 through 12. And the king of Israel said, alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And uh, and Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. Now I want us to look at this. The king of Israel, which was Ahab at the time, and Jehoshaphat, which was the king of Judah, they were coming together and they were going to do war. But Jehoshaphat was a godly king. And he said, I'm not going into battle until we hear a word from a prophet. And it's interesting. So he said, do we not have a prophet? He knew of Elijah, but Elijah's gone. And and so I want you to notice what the servant said. The servant didn't say, oh man, there's this new kid. Woo, he's got the anointing and the glory of God all over him. His name is Elisha. He's made an ax head float. He Man, he can read your mail. He can tell you everything about your life all the way down to almost your social security number. You know, that kind of thing you put in our day. I mean, but no. What did the servant say? The servant said he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now, we live in America. And we don't understand the cultural em- em- emphasis of this right here. And and I didn't understand it either until I was in Uganda, Africa. A dear friend of mine, Mike Croslow, who was a missionary in Uganda, Mike and I were, were ministering. And Mike took me into a place called Palissa, Uganda, which on the border of Tanzania and Uganda. And we're going to be there for three days. Now, honey, I'm going to tell you something. It may not have been the end of the world, but it was certainly visible from there. I mean, I told people, I mean, this is like where Tarzan and Jane lived. It was remote. 
And so you got the mud huts, you got the thatch roof. They're beautiful people. They're the Teso tribe. Mike and I got there and we weren't there for very, very long and we started preaching. I mean, we got an interpreter. I preach an hour, Mike preach an hour. We went back and forward for about four hours. And then finally, I said, hey, we're going to take a break. We're going to have lunch. And so we go into a little a mud church with that truth. And we're sitting there. They have a table. And, and of course, you got to remember, I'm from Arkansas. So I'm like, I'm like, I told him, I said, yeah, you know, I'll eat anything as long as it's not moving. Now, if it's moving, I'm not eating it. And of course they, they laughed and the pastors laughed at me and they were like, Oh, brother Terry, we, you're going to love this. And so they, they bring out some goat and I thought, Hey, I can eat that. And they brought out some soup and it looked pretty good. And then they bring out this stuff called millet. Now millet, man, it's dark. It's brown. And I call it play doh with gravel and it's real thick. And so I'm looking at this and then I looked at Mike and I said, where are the utensils? And he laughed. He said, utensils. These are your utensils. And I'm like, uh, so we're going to eat with our hands. I can eat pizza with my hands, but how do you eat soup with their hands? So they, they laughed and they said, Oh, let me show you. So they take the millet and they grab a big blob of it and then they, they take it and, and, it, and they roll it up in a ball and then they stick their, <laughs> stick their thumb in it, make a hole in it and then they run it through the soup and they eat it. And I'm going to tell you something, that stuff, whoo, it'll, 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 Stay with you for days. I'll say that, but I call it play doh with gravel. I mean, it's just so thick, man. It was hard to get down, but I did it. And but here's where I got the revelation. Right before we ate, in walked. I would say the the kid was probably 13, 14 years old, and he came up to me and he had a pitcher of water and he had a bar of soap. And I reached out my hands and. He poured the water over my hands as I washed my hands. Then he went around the table and he did it to all the pastors. And when we finished, he did the same thing again. Now I get back to uh, Arkansas where I lived at the time and I, and I'm reading through a uh, second Kings and I come to the scripture, Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. And when I saw that man, it went off in my heart and God took me back instantly to Uganda. And I saw that young boy washing my hands. That is exactly what Elisha did. Elisha was a servant. Uh, you, you will not hear. And uh, uh, historians, biblical historians say Elisha probably served him 10 to 20 years. So we don't know the span, but he served for quite, quite some time. He served Elisha, Elijah. He, he prepared his meal. You do, you will not hear any time, any miracle, any prophetic word. Elijah didn't go, Oh man, you're the next new prophet. So I'm going to let you do the morning services. I'll do the, I'll do the night services. No, all he did was prepare his food, wash his hands, prepare his clothes, took care of him literally for, for years. That was his preparation for the prophetic. And I want to say this, you will never move into any office of ministry until you move through the heart of an armor bear. It's not going to happen. You can try to bypass it and you're going to fail. Uh, I had a young man, oh gosh, that I knew and very prophetic, very anointed. Uh, and honestly, I'll say one thing, the word of knowledge flowed through him. And there were some things he even said to me that were very, very strong ministered to me, but he had some character flaws. And one time he was with me on a conference and he sat on the front row, listen to what I'm teaching. And most of the time his head was down. And I felt this so strong. When I finished the conference, I sat down by him and I said this to him. I said, now the Holy Spirit had you here today because he's trying to save your ministry. And he just looked at me. He said, I know it. I said, because if you don't get this in you, I don't care how strong you think you, your anointing is, you're going to fail miserably. And uh, I said, you're going to have to take this to heart. Well, what happened? Sure enough, uh, several months passed and situation happened and he offended some people. Uh, through prophetic words and other things. And so when it came time for him to be correct, corrected, you know, he told the leaders, well, you know, they were going to have a meeting with him and that's like any leadership would. 
And he told the leaders, he said, well, God told me not to come. Now, I'm going to just say this. God didn't tell him not to come. No, you are to submit to the authority over you. and You submit to the elders. That's biblical. So he was out of line. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot violate his word. I want everybody to get that. The Holy Spirit cannot, will not, impossible to violate his word. We, we have to submit to the Bible. I don't care what you think or what's going on in your life. It has to be founded in the scriptures. And so he left and got way off. And today, uh, he's got back into addiction, all kinds of stuff. And he's out of the ministry today. Why is that? Because he did not have the heart and the foundation of a servant. So, when you see what Elisha did, Elisha literally poured water over the hands. He was there to serve. Now, and, and you know, it's interesting in my background, when you look at Elijah and Elisha, you know what everybody, uh, if you hear a sermon on it, you know what the, the subject is? And most of you probably know it. It's the double portion. Everybody wants a double portion. I've had people come to me, pray for me. Oh, pass that anointing in me. And give me a double portion. Well, here's the truth. Most people want a double portion, but they don't have a clue how to get it. And that is not something that's just given. That is something that you walk out and I don't, and it, 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 it comes through a progression of faithfulness and being tested. I, there's no question that Elisha was tested in so many ways, but he was a servant to Elijah. He poured water on Elijah's hands, which proved he had that heart. Really, he was an armor bearer. That's where he was serving. Now, when you think about Elijah, I've often thought about this. How would you like to have been an associate to Elijah? And think about it, man, a guy who called fire down from heaven. Uh, I mean, the rain came, stopped the rain through his prayer. Wow. Uh, you know, think about following him. But here's the thing. Uh, Man, Elijah, even though he was a great man of God, I want you to, I want you to see something because I don't think Elijah probably was the easiest man to work for, but I want you to see something about it. I want you to see the human side because we see Elijah and we think, oh man, he's the one called, called up in a, in a chariot of fire. And, and I mean, he's preserved in heaven and he's the one who called rain, fire down. I mean, oh, he's the greatest prophet that ever lived. But watch this. When he was at Mount Carmel, there was a servant. Not sure if it was Elijah, Elisha or not, but, but what happened, he challenges the 450 prophets of Baal. And he said, let the God that be God answer by fire. And he said, so you guys go first. We're going to build two sacrifices. You call to Baal. And if the fire falls, we'll all submit to you. But if, if fire falls from me, then we're, we're coming back to God. God's the real God. So, I mean, and, uh, so they get out there, they're doing their deal. And then finally, after hours and hours, Elijah gets up and says, Hey, maybe you God's death. <laughs> maybe you God's on a vacation. One translation says, maybe you God's in the bathroom. I mean, he was antagonizing. Now that's wonderful. But what if you were the servant? Let me tell you, if you're the servant back there, you're thinking, oh my God, let the fire fall because man, if it don't work, they're going to kill him. And then I'm next on the list. That's when people go, we're behind you, pastor. We're behind you, <laughs> you know. But finally, Elijah said, enough, get out of the way. And he tells the servant, go pour water over the sacrifice. And you know, that kid had to do it by faith because I mean, he's thinking, you know, It'll be hard enough to get this thing lit dry, much less wet. But he did it in faith and poured it all over it. And uh, many of you know the story. Elijah said, God show him there's a God in Israel. Here it comes. I mean, licked up the water, the sacrifice. And I'll guarantee you, when that servant saw that fire fall, I'm sure he was going around, man, me and Elijah, we just like this. We was with you all the time, Pastor. Knew it, knew, knew you, you had heard from God. Yeah, that's... That's, it's easy when you see the fire fall. Now, all of a sudden, Elijah said, I, I'm going to pray and it's going to start raining. So he gets in, in a prayer position, tells the servant, go out there and look. Tell me what you see. Seven times he did. He comes back. So I see a cloud the size of a man's hand rising out of the ocean. And Elijah uh, 
says, get ready, it's raining. And it starts to rain. And all of a sudden, the presence of the God hits Elijah and he outran Ahab's chariots to Jezreel. Now, don't you think about from, from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, 17 miles. So if you can see, we got the fire God, we got the rain of God. And all of a sudden you got your, that prophet running about 20, 20, 25 miles an hour down the highway. Buddy, I'm going to tell you probably 30 miles an hour. He outran the chariots. And so you would think, oh my gosh, this is it. All of Israel is going to come to God. This is the outpouring. This is what we've been believing for. And the Bible didn't say the spirit of God came on servants. So he's probably running to Jezreel thinking, man, this is the day. Ooh, this is going to be so great. Elijah gets into Jezreel. And guess what? What happens? Jezebel hears about it. And Jezebel says, I will cut that man's head off before the sun sets. So what did this great a uh, man of faith and power do. He runs, runs from one woman. Now, now there, there's a message there, but we, we're not going to touch that. But here's the point. God would have honored him. God would have honored him had he stayed and faced her. He would have. He just did that to Mount Carmel. He could sure take care of Jezebel. But what happened? is the human side of Elijah kicked in and he got in total fear and he did a U-turn and he takes off running out. Now, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, how fast was he running when he left town? He may have been doing about 30 or 40 out running out. Well, he meets the, the, the servant on the road and, and the servant's like, Oh, Elijah, what's going on? And Elijah said, Oh, God's forsaken me. All is lost. Ran in the wilderness and prayed to die. You see the the human frailty of carrying such an office. There is a mantle, there's a responsibility. And when the human side comes and there's been, that's what's that's what's hit. That's what's so critical right now. And, and people are trying, uh, we, we've got such an onslaught of spirit of antichrist against the church and against leadership, against pastors and leaders nowadays. We, we've never seen it before, but it's here. And that is why the spirit of God is speaking to the church. Pete, speaking to you right now, as you watch this, you are an Aaron and a her, and it's time that you rise up and hold up the arms of your leader. If there's going to come the spirit of victory and the battle that Moses was fighting at that time, Joshua was in the valley. You know, that is where once the battle was won, it is called Jehovah Nisi. He was called Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our victory. You know how the victory came? Didn't come from Moses holding up the rod. It came from Moses with Aaron and her. Aaron and her held it up all day long. Now, here's the thing. You hold up a man's rod like they did all day long. You're going to get a good whiff of B.O. You are. You're going to see the human side in that leader. And that's, that's what, that, that's where we're at. But it is time. Uh, man, we stand together. If he's going to become Jehovah Nisi, we're going to see that spirit of victory back in the church. That's what's going to have to happen. And that's where God is moving. That's what God is impressing me right now and just releasing me back in uh, to the church to teach this message and to pour it out, uh, everywhere I can and to pour it in you and, and to impart this in you because we, we get a witness of Elijah and we see the human side and you cannot fall apart when you see the human side of your leader. Uh, there's a demonic attack of the devil against us and we have to stand strong and we've got to pray for one another and pray for your leader, support them, run with the vision of the house and connect to them. When I was serving in ministry, I remember I read a book and it, it was called the four faces of Jesus. And as I read it, it dealt with Revelation chapter four, verse seven. It was talking about the four different creatures that circle the throne. They cry, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And it was the, the one was the face of a lion. One was the face of a calf. One was the face of a man. And the other was the face of an eagle. And the author describes this as the four faces of Jesus. Jesus was a lion. Jesus was a calf. Jesus was a, a, a human. And Jesus was also an eagle. And as, as I read that book, I'll never forget because I really, it stirred my heart, but also 
I also saw how it deal really with leaders and especially pastors. Uh, pastors are going to be aligned. Pastors are going to be the servant. They are human and they're also the, the eagle. Jesus was this. Now, yeah, you may say, how was Jesus aligned? Well, let's just look at it. Man, he was rough on the Pharisees. You know what he said to the religious people? He said, you're of your, you're of your father, the devil. He ran them out, man. They hated him for the way he, what he spoke. Now he was strong. And then when he went in the temple that day, oh my gosh, he made a whip and he beat those people right out of the temple. I always say, man, how would you like to bend the door greeter that day? Oh, well, here's my, here's my pastor. Here he comes and he's whipping the daylights out of somebody and runs them out of the temple. Man, I mean, uh, you'd be going, oh, my pastor, I don't know what's wrong with him. Oh gosh. And, and you just, oh, I'm leaving this church, you know, but you know what Jesus did it? Cause they showed a lack of respect and honor to the house of God. Now I'll say this, whatever you honor, you'll pull to you. What you dishonor will flee from you. If you can't honor the gift and the call of God and your pastor and any men or women of God, it'll run from you. But what you honor it will, you will pull it into you. You'll receive the impartation and the gift of God that's in them. Uh, the lion, the calf, the man and the eagle, the lion, a pastor will be a lion. And you say, how's a pastor going to be a lion? Well, there's, you've got to understand in the body of Christ, there's three kinds of people. There are sheep, there are goats and there are wolves. A sheep you can minister to, a goat's going to butt everything. Uh, they'll say, you know, I tell you what, but, but, you know, I could have done better. I mean, I don't know why the pastor's teaching this, but, you know, what he needs to do is this and just button everything. Now, goats, I'm going to tell you, they'll stay around. They'll support and give for a while, but they're going to move somewhere else unless they are changed to, unless they're humble enough. And they see where they're at and they, they become a sheep because a sheep will submit and a sheep hears the shepherd's voice and follows that shepherd. Now a wolf, a wolf is here to devour. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, how do you know, uh, someone's a wolf? It's not difficult. Just remember, Jesus said they come in sheep's clothing. They'll look like a sheep, smell like a sheep, but they're a wolf. And, and what they do, most of them are the most spiritual people you've ever met. They have more visions and dreams than, than anyone else. And they see Jesus more than the father sees him. And you may find that humorous, but it really is the truth. They come in, oh, they look, they're the most spiritual. Oh, and then they start off with flattery. Pastors, leaders watch this because they come in and they'll, oh, you're just the best pastor in the world. They send you notes. I love you. I'm praying. I just want to be a special prayer warrior for you. And, and look, I'm here to stand with you and your family. And I've just never heard anybody teach like you. And you just think, man, these people are really supporting me. Yeah. They're building that because they're about to pull something from you because then they'll come. Oh, you know, I got a new revelation after, uh, out of what you taught. And I just feel like, you know, God wants me to release this to the body. They're always looking for a platform, always looking for your pulpit. And you have, you have to know that, you know, I had so many people coming in at one time there. I'm a prophet. We had so many prophets coming through. Someone came to me and they said, Oh, Pastor Terry, there's a prophet in the house. And I laughed. I said, look, you go tell them this is a non-profit ministry. Cause you know what? You want to be a prophet, learn to serve because you'll never enter into the prophetic until you know how to serve. If you can come in that church and say, without your title, without your office blasting out in front of you and never come in like that. You come in there with a heart to serve. You know, it's interesting. The Lord said something to me one day. He said to me, if I came into your church, how do you think I would come? And he ministered this to me. He said, I would come up to the leader, to the pastor of that church. I would come up to it. And the thing I would say is I'm here. I want to become a member of this church what can I do to support you and help you fulfill your vision? You go, no, he wouldn't do that. Yes, he would. You know, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he knows it's not about his title. It's about who he is. He's a servant. 
and he would come in and he would recognize your authority. Besides that, he puts you there. And that's, that's the heart of Jesus. And that's the heart we, we must have. It's not about us. It's not about our title. It's not about looking for a title. You don't need a title to serve. You, you, you start serving and giving yourself. Now, any, any shepherd, when it comes to the wolf, I'm just going to tell you right now, he's going to, he's going to move them out. And you can't sit back and judge. Well, I just think he, he didn't really understand that person's gift. You don't know the situation and you can't, you can't stand back and judge it. No, you have to realize that there, that, that shepherd, thank God he's the way he is. He's there to protect you and protect the flock. And you've got to allow them to do that and, and not judge them when they do. Uh, then the calf, the calf is the servant. Jesus was a servant. That is a pastor's or servants. They, they serve continually. They're there to serve the people. Then there's the human side. You know, every man, woman of God has their own unique personality. That's their DNA. It's, it's who they are. They can't change that. Now, yes, you have to bring that under the submission of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but you know, they're going to miss it. They're, they're human. You may say, well, the apostles never missed it. Yeah, they did. Peter was, was eating with the Gentiles. And when the Jews showed up, he starts eating with the Jews and, and stayed away. And Paul confronts him to his face. Well, he had, you know, that's prejudice. That was in his heart. I'm telling you, that was sin. He had to judge it. And then the apostle Paul and Barnabas like to have blows. Oh, when they were like, getting ready to go on their missionary journey. Uh, so you, you got to see there's a human personality and Paul didn't have a lot of patience with people who couldn't follow his path. So, you know, these were, these were men. They were, they, they, they made mistakes. I don't care how great and anointed they were. They still made mistakes. And so men are going to make mistakes. I'm not making excuses for sin, but sometimes people want to put you on this pedestal that you're some supernatural individual that just walks in the clouds with Jesus all the time because they hear you from the pulpit and they just think, man, this person's just perfect. But no, you know, I do the best I can, but I'm human. I go on conferences and I come back. I mean, when I'm on a conference, everybody thinks I'm the best thing since sliced bread almost. Oh, you're so annoying and all this. I come back home, man. I got to take out the trash. I got, I got to deal with, with things happening with my kids, my grandchild and, and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's part of it. I mean, and, and there are things I like, things I don't like, you know, so it's who we are. I remember one time this guy came to me years ago and he said, the Lord told me, God spoke to me. I'm going to come over. I'm going to do your yard all summer long, uh, trim your hedges. You won't have to mess with anything. <laughs> I was sitting there going, man, ooh, I know that's the Lord because I'm not just fond of yard work. You know, yard works under the curse. Adam had to sin. We didn't do all this stuff, pick weeds, but some people love it, but that's not my gift. And so I was like, hallelujah. He came and uh, man, I grabbed my tennis racket and I went out to play tennis, came back, beautiful job. He did it second week. And then third week, he's gone. Fourth week, he's gone. I do it myself. And finally, I see him in church and I said, hey, man, I really appreciated you doing this for me. And I said, did I offend you? He goes, well, matter of fact, you did. And I said, well, I apologize. What did I do? You went and played tennis while I was mowing your yard. You sh- you're a man of God, aren't you? And I said, well, yes. He said, I think you need to be in word and prayer while I'm doing that. And I looked at him and I said, I'm going to tell you something. And I'll say this in love. Number one, that's a religious spirit. Uh, and you're released. You, I don't want you around my yard. And I want to say this to you. If you look at even God took a day off. Even God took a day off. And I, I bet you God relaxed and chilled. He had a day off. And I said, and that's my day off. That's the day I relax. And I said, and I appreciated it because you were honoring me. But now, no, you got a religious spirit and you need help. And that, that is the way people do sometimes as crazy as it is. They, they get up and they think, Oh, you know, the pastor, he has to be so legalistic. No, legalism is wrong. Uh, we got to be free to be ourselves. Now, here's the thing. I want everybody to listen to me. None of us get the opportunity to be high maintenance. No, we have to be low maintenance. We are called to be low maintenance. That's scriptural. You don't get the privilege to be high maintenance. So 
You know, if you're high maintenance, buddy, you need to get, you need to humble yourself. Do you become low maintenance? And that goes for all of us. But so there's the, the human side. Then there's the ego, which is the spiritual. Now, every pastor will reveal all four faces, the lion in dealing with wolves, calf in serving people, the man in making mistakes, and the eagle in ministering the word. Elisha had persistence to stay with his vision and calling. Tradition says he walked into 20 years. I'm going to close this up, but I want you to listen to me. Here's what I want you to get. Elijah got ready to go. Uh, sons of the prophets run up to Elisha. Don't you know Elijah's going today? He said, I know it. Hold your peace. And they did that three times. And I want you to listen to me. It'll not be the sinner who'll try to talk you out of being faithful. Uh, it, it'll be Christian people. They'll come up. Oh, you've been faithful. Thus saith the Lord. I heard you speak the other day. God's ready for you to be exalted and be promoted. You're to leave your pastor and go. No, you can't allow that stuff to happen. You got to stay true to your calling. Now you may be released by the Holy Spirit, but you have to stay true to your calling because I'm going to tell you something. When I wrote the armor bearer after I wrote it, that was when I was tested. Now I was tested some. Before I wrote it, but I'm going to tell you when I wrote it, that's when I really got tested. And I stayed 13 more years after the book was written because there was some times, man, my attitude, I was like, why am I putting up with this? I, I've got people wanting me to come and I could go on my, on my own. The armor bear's gone all over the world. And I mean, my wife said to me one day, Terry, when's the last time you read your book? And I said, Oh my gosh, it's that woman thou gave us me, you know, but she was right. And I had to judge my heart. Sometimes I'd look at it and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I wrote that. But yeah, I got to submit to it. And so Elisha, man, he stayed true. And then Elijah turned to him and he says this to him. He says, what do you want? What do you want? And when I, I was teaching this one day and the spirit of God said to me, he said, uh, who was the one that received the double portion? And I stopped and I said, wow, it's the one carrying the water. And I will say this. There are those of you who have been faithful. You have gone through your years of serving in the heart of an armor bear. Get ready. God's about to promote you in this season, in these last days. A new anointing, a new refreshing is coming upon you. You get ready for it in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for you. Father, I release the double portion. I release that anointing to serve that heart of an armor bearer. I pray for everyone watching this video. You'll never be the same because of this teaching. And I thank you, God, minister to the pastors and the leaders as they watch. This. Thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus name. You want my material, go to God's get the books, let this go in your heart. There's a new anointing coming. If you're, if you're interested in my mentoring program, you want me to come into your area, uh, just contact through my website. There's an armor bear awakening coming and God is looking to you and he's anointing you to move and support your leaders. God bless you.